So, uh, to my um, fourth lecture on one-dimensional computational topology, um, this will be um, another lecture about algorithms. Um, tomorrow, there'll be a lecture about pretty pictures. Th there'll be pretty pictures today, of course, but, but the, the, the problem that I want to talk about today is a fundamental problem in algorithms and combinatorial optimization that surprisingly to us at the time had, uh, had topology buried underneath it. Um, and uh, the problem has much, much older roots. Uh, it goes back to you know, Kantorovich studying railway planning in the 1910s and Jacobi doing matrix permutations in the 1800s and Gaspar Monge digging trenches in the 1700s. But um, the modern formulation of the problem that I'm going to talk about dates back to the mid-1950s in a secret government lab in the United States uh, where um, uh, there was a lot of combinatorial optimization and algorithm, fundamental algorithms work happened in the US in the 1950s at a place called the Rand Corporation. Um, the Rand Corporation was a defense department think tank basically set up to outthink the dirty Russian communists um, to win the Cold War. And so a lot of stuff that was only declassified in the late 20th and early 21st century, such as this map, um, were studied there. But a significant fraction of the material that is studied in a modern 21st century algorithms course was developed within the walls of this quasi-secret organization. Some of it was published then, and some of it was only published later. But in particular, um, Lester Ford and Delbert Fulkerson, who were working at RAND, uh, were uh, studying this problem called maximum flow. And um, Harris and Ross, who were working at RAND, this map came from a document that was only declassified in 1999. He gave an example of the fl maximum flow problem. Well, they had some resources that needed to go through the railway network of the Warsaw Pact countries. Um, there's a node for every major city in Eastern Europe. The red node is Berlin. The green node up at the top um, wasn't actually a node in the map, but it's approximately the location of Moscow. And um, the, 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 the circles have numbers in them that are basically just identifiers. But the lines connecting the circles have numbers in them that represent the amount of railway traffic that can go directly between those two cities. And the question that Harris and Ross were, uh, were, were asking, or one of the questions, is how much stuff can we get from Moscow to Berlin, um, assuming we drive railway traffic through the system at, um, at a steady state? How quickly can we move resources Soldiers, coal, uh, espresso, whatever you want to move from Moscow to Berlin um, uh, through the network. And both Harris and Ross and later Ford and Fulkerson recognized that there was a, a line that you could draw on the map. We, the, the Russians are going to send troops to Berlin to fight off the dirty, rotten, corrupt Westerners. They're not going to send them to, you know, they're going to take Berlin back over. But they don't, but they don't know minimum cut max. So. Oh, yes, they do. Did I not mention Kantorovich just a few seconds ago? <laughs> so, well, though we didn't realize that at the time. Um, so uh, Harris and Ross noticed that there was this line that you could draw through the map, which they referred to as the bottleneck. And so this is the, the, the dual question, not how quickly can they move resources from one point to another, but how cheaply can we disrupt the network? If we are going to bomb certain railway lines, and bombs are expensive, so we want to use as few of them as possible, um, and there's one bomb that takes out one railway line, where should we aim the bombs to disconnect these two cities? So in a, in a um, as they call the bottleneck, we now refer to this as a, as a minimum cut. So um, more abstractly, the input to 
the maximum flow minimum cut problem is something called the flow network. This is a graph that has two special nodes called S and T for source and target. Um, every, uh, for purposes of this talk, let's just think about the graph as being undirected, although that's not really um, important. We'll go to directed graphs later in the talk. Um, every edge has a capacity function. This is intuitively the, um, the, the, the width of the railway lines going from one city to another. This is how much stuff, the rate at which you can push resources through that edge. And then the maximum flow problem is to assign values and directions to the edges that correspond to the flow of resources through the system. So when I write here 5 over 7 on that edge from S down to its um, lower neighbor, that means I'm sending 5 units of flow through an edge that has capacity 7. Now, the, these, these flows have to satisfy um, certain properties. One is, except at the source and target, the source that's producing the resource and the target that's consuming it, everywhere else, if resources come in, they also must go out. So if you look, for example, at the bottom edge, the bottom left vertex here, um, I've got six units of flow going in, five from the left and one from the right. And I've got six units of flow going out, two going up and two going to the right. And that same is true at every other vertex of the network, except at S where, where resources are only going out and T where resources are only going in. The second constraint is that the flow has to be feasible. You can't send more stuff through the pipes than the capacity. Or, you know, you can't send, if there are 10 railway lines deep, you can't send more than 10 trains at a time. Um, and the last is that we want the flow to have maximum value. So the, the total amount of resources being produced by S or equivalently the total amount of resources being consumed by T must be as large as possible subject to these other constraints. Yes? Okay. That it, I mean, yes, there could be cycles in there, which means, in particular, the maximum flow is not unique. Maybe I want to send flow up, maybe I want to send flow down, maybe they're isolated cycles that look stupid, but it's consistent with the statement of the problem. Okay. Um, the, the, the other problem, the, the minimum cut problem, is uh, I want to find a subset of the edges, which I'll refer to as the cut, that have the property that every path from S to T goes through at least one of these edges. So if I delete these edges, there is no more paths from S to T. The graph is not just disconnected, but disconnected in the right way. And secondly, the total capacity of the edges that I delete needs to be as small as possible. And the, one of the you know, foundational results in combinatorial optimization is that at some level these two problems are identical. Right? Um, the intuition you should have is think of the capacity as the width of a street between joining these two things and people are marching side by side. Um, the total amount that you, you push through the system at some point there's kind of a, 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 a bottleneck, a place where you can't squeeze more people through. Um, that exactly corresponds to the minimum cut over here. Okay. Um, this is um, an example um, of linear programming duality. If you write down the constraints as linear equations and inequalities and linear objective functions for maximum flow, and then you do the same thing for minimum cut, these two linear programs are formally duals of each other. And then there's a mechanical transformation from one to the other. Um, uh, this is also uh, related, uh, it has its origins back in topology, um, but, but in like topology topology, not in algebraic topology, um, back with Menger, where uh, Menger was originally trying to prove that um, if a, in any topological space where two points can be connected by at least k disjoint, um, disjoint arcs, and there's some pair of points that can be connected by only k disjoint arcs, then you can di disconnect the space by deleting k points. This is what Menger actually 
proved. It's, Menger's theorem is usually proved and stated in terms of graphs, but Menger was a topologist who's actually interested in more general topological spaces. Um, and, and interestingly, Menger actually proved his theorem on a bet. Um, he said, no, 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 I, 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 I don't, somebody bet him that he couldn't prove the theorem by the, the, the next morning's lecture. And um, he did. Um, okay, so why, why do we care about this? Um, the answer to this question obviously depends on the value of the variable we, but um, if we are computer scientists, then there are uh, lots of problems that computer scientists play with that ultimately either reduce to maximum flows and minimum cuts or can be reframed as, as natural generalizations of maximum flows and minimum cuts. Uh, these have to do, you know, things like um, airline scheduling, uh, image segmentation, uh, um, uh, various types of, of network routing problems. Um, there are lots of, you know, network design, um, for example, is, is uh, the problem. I need to design a graph that has certain connectivity properties. Um, and so, you know, again, a lot of the motivation for the things that I do comes from looking at pretty pictures and SIGGRAPH proceedings. Uh, so one place that um, minimum cuts show up in the computer graphics world is in um, segmentation of meshes and surfaces. So these people uh, observe that they want to build a database where you can look up surfaces by saying, I've got this thing. Do you have anything similar in your database that can help me identify it? And they observed that if you break the, 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 the objects up into similar pieces, so simpler pieces, and index those simpler pieces, then you can speed up this, the, the indexing process. Um, this is actually somewhat similar to the problem that, um, uh, related to the problem that Aaron talked about with you know, finding, finding uh, uh, similarity of curves on surfaces. Um, and uh, these people observe that the, the system performs somewhat better if the curves you use to separate the pieces into different parts are short, right? So they recast this as, a, as an extension of a, of a max flow min cut problem. But this also shows up on the mathematics side. Uh, so um, John Sullivan in 1990 in his PhD thesis um, was, you know, there's a long chain of people who've done this, who studied um, solutions for what's called Plateau's problem. You're given a curve, typically a curve uh, floating in R3, and you want to construct a minimum area surface that has that curve as its boundary. And what Sullivan observed that is at least in a discrete setting where you fill the rest of, the, of, of space with, by breaking it up into, into cubes or tetrahedra or something, that, uh, and you're looking for a minimal surface that lives in the two skeleton of that cell complex, that can actually be cast directly as a um, maximum flow minimum cut problem. Right. Now, this particular picture comes from a, a, a fairly recent survey by Jer Jenny Harrison and, and Harrison Pugh. Uh, this is both the last names of the two authors and the full name of the last author. Um, uh, I believe the story is when they got married, he changed his first name. Um, uh, so it's a beautiful survey. I mean, there's lots of, lots of further things that one can do to optimize surfaces beyond doing this discrete maximum flow stuff. Um, this this uh, showed up more recently in the computational geometry world uh, in a, in a uh, uh, fairly uh, nice paper by uh, Tamal Day and Neil Harani and, and um, Krishnamurthy. Um, but th these flow problems are sort of natural for Think of this as, as the cut. The cut is the thing that you're trying to minimize. That's what actually ends up corresponding to this minimal surface. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so, so when he was born, he changed his first name. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Apologize to, to, to Jenny the next time you see her. Okay. So, um, as usual, uh, I want to start with, because uh, I, 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 you know, before we get to more complicated topology, um, I need to start in the plane. <laughs>
So um, let's suppose this flow network uh, is actually a planar graph. Okay? So um, uh, I'm going to do more or less what I always do when I see a planar graph. I'm going to say, OK, duality might be important. Um, let me remember that there's this dual graph whose vertices correspond to faces, whose faces correspond to vertices, and edges go, go um, back and forth. The edges correspond. Um, and I, because I'm dealing with flows which have a direction, I actually need to think about um, the duality between directed planar graphs. And um, in this case, the, just I'm going to establish a standard that um, every directed edge has a, goes from its tail to its head, and it has a left side and it has a right side, which are, are faces on either side of it. And the, the, the way to dualize this is to say the head of the dual edge is the same as the right shore of the primal edge, and the head, the tail of the dual edge is the same as the left shore of the primal edge. So intuitively, to go from the primal and the dual, you rotate 90 degrees clockwise. Now, formally, to make this work out, you also have to change the definition of clockwise in the dual to the other way, so that the dual is the dual is the dual. But um, if you just want to remember, you know, head, tail goes to, uh, in the dual edge goes from the left to the right. Um, this is also consistent with the, you know, winding number definitions and things like that. Going back to Gauss. Um, this is just the convention we'll adopt. Okay. Now, um, we know a fair amount about planar graphs because ultimately they're just, you know, discrete versions of the plane. Um, in particular, uh, Whitney established um, back in the 1930s uh, the planar graph version of the Jordan curve theorem, which says that if you uh, take a cycle in the dual graph that separates the faces, S star and T star, that is going to dualize to a cut that separates the vertices, S and T. If you want to separate things, you do it with a cycle. Okay? Um, symmetrically, any collection of edges in the original graph that separates S and T, if it's minimal, you know, you, if, you, if you can throw out edges and there's still separation, go ahead and throw them out. Then when you dualize, uh, you're going to get a cycle in the dual graph that separates the corresponding sets of faces. Okay? So a cut is a subset of vertices whose deletion, a subset of edges whose deletion separates the vertices. And a cycle is a collection of edges whose deletion separates the faces. Because faces and vertices are just duals of each other. Um, so uh, in particular, um, if we're looking for the minimum cost collection of edges that separate S from T, then in the dual we're looking for the minimum cost collection of edges that separate S star from T star. And if over in the dual graph, we think of that cost as length. And we uh, imagine, instead of saying separating S star and T star, let's just delete S star and T star from the sphere. And now what we have is a graph that's drawn on the annulus. And what we're looking for is the shortest cycle that winds once around the annulus. And so. Uh, in other words, we're looking for the shortest topologically non-trivial cycle in the annulus. And at this point, you should remember that's the problem we solved yesterday. Okay. Um, but it's a very, very simple example of the problem we solved yesterday. And it was solved um, in this specific case uh, decades before we considered the more general one. Okay. So the problem we really want to solve is this one. Given a graph drawn on an annulus, find the shortest cycle that separates the two boundaries of the annulus. Okay, so um, Itai and Shilok in the, in the 1970s said, let's do the following thing. We find a shortest path connecting the two boundaries. Okay, remember the, the red thing that we're looking for, we don't know what it is yet. Let's find a shortest path connecting the two boundaries, call that pi and cut the annulus open so that it becomes a disk. And now uh, the shortest cycle 
um, becomes a shortest path between the two clones of the vertex that uh, happens to lie on that path. Um, and so a little bit of case analysis with, um, with shortest paths implies that whatever that shortest cycle is, it can only cross that shortest path at, at most once, and because it winds around the annulus, it must cross that path at least once. So there is a place where the path that we're looking for, in, the cycle we're looking for in red, crosses the path that we've constructed in blue. When you say cross, are they allowed to? They're allowed to merge for a while and then separate, but it'll come in from the left, follow the path for a while, and then leave to the right. Um, what would happen when you cut it op open is that the red path would follow along the boundary um, along the blue for a while. Okay, so um, we're topologists, so we don't really care how the picture is drawn. So I'll just, I'll just move the embedding around so that it looks like a rectangle. Um, and now um, we're looking for the shortest path from a vertex on the left to the corresponding vertex on the right. And among all those choices, we want the shortest, shortest path. Okay. So in the 1970s, Itai and Shilok solved this problem by brute force. They said, just compute a shortest path tree at every vertex on the left. That'll give you the distance to the corresponding vertex on the right. Um, and then there is a long, long history of faster and faster results um, that Reif developed a divide and conquer algorithm. Uh, then uh, Fre Fredrickson and later Henziger developed a much, 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 much more complicated divide and conquer algorithm. Uh, then Klein came along and uh, came up with the, the multiple source shortest path problem and simplified the n log n algorithm. You just do uh, run a multiple source shortest path algorithm along the left edge, exactly what I showed you yesterday. Um, and then uh, some of Klein's students and collaborators uh, took the much, much more complicated um, divide and conquer algorithm and combined it with multiple source shortest paths and made it even more complicated, but uh, got the log down to a log log. Um, and nobody really believes that that log log is there, but we're kind of stuck. Um, we really think it should be linear time. Okay, and so this is how we do minimum cuts in the plane. We reduce it to uh, finding the shortest path from one side of a rectangle to the other. Okay. So what if we're on a more complicated surface? Well, um, here's my setup. Again, as usual, I have um, the, you know, a, a surface map of some kind. Now I have, again, weights on the edges, but they correspond to capacity, not length. Um, and I've got two special vertices, S and T. Um, and I want to do minimum cut things. So based on the intuition that other people have given me from the plane, um, it's natural to say, oh, duality is probably going to be important. So once again, I'm going to remember that there is a, a dual map of the map that I've been given whose vertices correspond to faces, whose faces correspond to vertices, and whose edges correspond to edges. In particular, the terminal vertices S and T are going to correspond to faces S star and T star in the dual map. Okay, this is, we've seen this picture before. Um, and now what we're interested in doing is finding a small collection of edges that separates S from T in the original given map. And when we were in the plane, we said, oh, right, Whitney's duality, the Jordan curve theorem, this basically means we're looking for a cycle in the dual graph. We know how to find one cycle, that, sure. Um, unfortunately, it's not so clean in the surface case, because the dual of a Cut isn't necessarily a single cycle anymore. All right, in this particular case, I, the cheapest way to separate the, face, the set of faces containing S star from a set of faces containing T star is this triple of cycles. 
I need something that is the boundary of some faces this way and the boundary of some faces that way, but boundaries in higher genus surfaces are not necessarily cycles the way they are in the plane. Minimal boundaries are not necessarily cycles. So all of you are topologists, so you already know what we're doing. What are we doing? What? Um, no, it's possible that they can share vertices. Cheaper, well, cheaper if they share vertices and edges. No, they can't share edges. It's a set of edges that needs to separate these things. That you can all, you, it, it, you'll see. What, what are we doing? What do you see here as topologists? Pants. Pants. Okay, I want to separate S star from T star. I don't have cycles anymore. I have boundaries. I have boundaries. What am I doing? Good. Thank you. <laughs> We're doing homology. You still have, okay, fine. You should have said cohomology then. <laughs> okay. Um, we're doing homology. Um, and of course, you know, finally I get to, 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 to invoke Poincaré at the Poincaré Institute. Um, uh, so um, in particular, we're doing a very elementary version of homology. We're doing homology with coefficients in Z2, and we're doing homology in surface graphs. And both of these simplify the theory to the point where I don't need to talk about linear algebra, but I will anyway. Okay, so I'm going to say that two subgraphs, in this case of the dual graph, are Z2 homologous if their symmetric difference is the boundary of a subset of faces. Okay, symmetric difference is just addition in Z mod 2. Um, boundary of union of faces, well, a union of faces is just a two chain in Z mod 2. Okay. So, uh, uh, in particular, what I'm uh, looking for is uh, a way of separating the faces that, and some collection of faces that contains S star from some collection of faces that contains T star. So this red thing is um, null homologous in the, um, in the surface map that you see on the screen here, which is the dual of the one we were given at the beginning. Okay, so a cut always corresponds to some sort of null homologous one chain, but when, Z in, uh, when you're working over Z2, a one chain is just a subgraph. Some edges are in and some edges are out. Um, um, if I say this a little bit differently, and I need to enforce that S star is on one side of the, of, uh, of the, the, the one cycle and T star is on the other, Another way to say this is, just like we did in the plane, we removed those two faces, leaving us with an annulus. I'm going to imagine just deleting those two faces from the surface. And now what I'm looking for is the, uh, something that's homologous with the boundary of S star, this boundary cycle over here, in the surface that I get by deleting both of those faces. Equivalently, it's homologous with the boundary of T star. Okay, so the yellow faces are the subset of faces whose boundary is the stuff in red and the boundary of S star. And so if I take the boundary of S star, symmetric difference with the red stuff, in this case that's just a union, and the union of those four cycles is the boundary of these yellow faces. So the, it's null homologous. Okay. So I want to find a minimum cost subgraph of the dual network that is homologous with the boundary of one face in the surface minus those two faces. Right? If you now imagine that the surface is the sphere, deleting those two faces, you get an annulus. I want something homologous to one of its boundaries. The same problem. Okay. So how do we do this? Um, so a little bit of case analysis um, implies that each of the cycles in this minimum one cycle, um, this, this, uh, this minimum homologous subgraph, each of these cycles is as short as possible in its own homology class. So 
This cycle up at the top is the shortest cycle that winds through the hole exactly once. This cycle down here is the shortest cycle that winds through the other cycle exactly once. The cycle in the middle is the shortest cycle that winds between the two holes exactly once. Okay. Um, and so what we're going to do is um, we say, well, I don't know what homology classes will uh, contribute cycles to the minimum cut. So I am just going to try them all. So my strategy is I'm just going to enumerate all possible homology classes. And for each homology class, I'm going to find the shortest cycle. And then I'll do some post-processing to figure out the right subset of these things to sew together. And now, the homology classes, as, as all of you hopefully know, um, uh, define a nice vector space over Z mod 2. Um, you know, this is something I have to explain to computer scientists a little bit more slowly. Yeah. Yes. Um, how does this work? I mean, I can see why you're so important, except for when SRT starts up on the logic uh, on the minimal. Uh... So it's possible that these, the, that the thing that we're looking for, these red edges, will share edges with S star or share edges with T star. Yes. It's possible, in fact, that S star and T star will share edges, which means there'll be a little, you know, you think, should think of it as a little ribbon separating them along the common edge. So when I delete the face, I'm deleting the interior, the open disk. I'm leaving something hanging in between. OK. okay. Um, so just by parameter counting, uh, the, num the dimension of the first homology group is 2G plus 1. It's plus 1 because I've deleted these two faces. Um, and so I need to enumerate about 4 to the G distinct homology classes. Okay. Now, um, I, just to remind you where homology comes from, um, what's going on is the usual definition of homology is cycles mod boundaries. A cycle in this setting is a subgraph whose boundary is empty. That means a subgraph where every vertex has even degree, because if it had odd degree, the boundary would actually use that vertex, you know, odd mod two, which is one time. Um, the, the boundary subgroup is boundaries of unions of faces. Um, and uh, homology is the, you know, the quotient of one with the other. So counting parameters here, um, even subgraphs, there are um, each, I, I need to write down E bits to specify a subgraph. And that at each of the vertices, I have a linear constraint that the degree at this vertex must be even. But one of those linear constraints is redundant because if the subgraph has even degree everywhere but at one spot, it must also have even degree at that spot because the sum of the degrees is always even. So the total dimension of the cycle space is E minus V plus 1. On the other hand, if I want to specify a boundary subgraph, I just record for each face, is it part of the subset of faces whose boundary I'm considering or not? Um, and there are exactly f minus two faces because I deleted s star and t star. And then um, one of these is a subspace of the other. So uh, when, I, when I mod, I'm just subtracting the dimensions. And here you see Euler's formula popping back up again immediately, giving you the right parameter count. Okay. So um, one thing I need to be able to do if I want to find the shortest cycle in a homology class is I need to be able to tell what the homology class of a cycle is. Um, so one way to do that is uh, basically to construct a cohomology basis. So uh, the way that you, you, you do this is you find a collection of, psych of paths going from S star to T star that has as many paths as possible that uh, cut the surface into a disk. This is kind of an analog of the system of loops which we, used, we could use to generate the fundamental group. Um, here I'm using a, a, a collection of paths. It's possible to construct this quickly using an analog of a tree co-tree decomposition. 
um, uh, this is not where the interesting stuff happens. Um, but given this collection of 2G plus 1 paths, um, whose complement is a disk, uh, I can measure the homology class of a cycle by just asking which of these paths does the cycle cross an odd number of times. Okay. Now, suppose I've, I've constructed this and now I say I want to find the shortest cycle in homology class 01001. How do I do that? So I'm going to do this by lifting up to a covering space. Just like when we were looking for, short, for testing homotopy, we at least abstractly considered lifting up to the universal cover and seeing if things closed up. Um, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, only I'm going to, I'm going to lift to a smaller homology space um, whose uh, set of deck transformations is just the first homology group. So uh, this we refer to as the Z2 homology cover. And um, I, I've drawn a, a, the, the simplest non-trivial example I can and also the most complicated non-trivial um, example that I can for uh, this space because anything more complicated, the, you know, the, these things blow up pretty fast. So if, if I have a pair of pants, um, the cohomology basis consists of just two paths. So the way that I would construct the Z2 homology cover for the pair of pants is I would cut the pair of pants into a disk along those two paths, and then I would make four copies of, the, of that disk, one for each of the four homology classes, because in this case, the first homology group has dimension two. And then I will glue these copies back together, not back to each copy back to itself, but rather um, I glue two copies along the corresponding uh, sides of path one if the signatures of those copies differ in bit one. And I'll glue them together along path two if the signatures differ in bit two. Okay. So over here, you'll notice that um, copy zero, zero and copy one, zero are glued together along copies of path one because their first bits differ. One, zero and one, one are glued along path number two because their second bits differ um, and so on around the cycle. Okay, so starting with this, I would create 32 copies of this disk and I would glue those 32 copies together in a pattern that resembles a five-dimensional cube, which is why I'm not drawing you the picture. And, um, this is exactly the covering space that you get that, the, whose deck transformations is H1, if you want the more abstract definition. But the algorithm is actually going to build this structure. So um, I need to describe it in a way that can be, be actually implemented by a machine. Now, um, this surface is somewhat complicated um, because I'm, I'm collecting 2 to the 2G plus 1 copies of my original surface, which had complexity n, and so I'm going to get this much higher complexity n hat. Um, and a little computation with Euler's formula should also convince you that the resulting surface has genus exponential in the genus that I started with. Okay. Now, why do I want to do this thing? Well, if I look at a cycle in my original surface, and I pick an arbitrary base point, um, remember that I can test, I can determine the homology class of the cycle by seeing which of those, those paths it crosses. Now, um, just like in the universal cover, I can lift uh, now that's a loop because I have a base point. I can lift that loop up to a covering space. So I pick an arbitrary lift of the point and for convenience I'm going to lift it to the copy with label zero. And I follow the path around in the covered space and I end up in this case in copy one one. Because the cycle crossed path one and then path two. And so up in the covering space the same cycle crosses path one and then path two. And so I flip bit one and flip bit two, and I end up 
in copy 1, 1. That's because I'm in, that cycle that I started with is in homology class 1, 1. Okay. So um, any cycle in a particular homology class is going to lift to a path from a point in copy 0, 0 to a point in the, the corresponding point in the copy whose label is that homology vector. In particular, if I'm looking for the shortest cycle in a homology class, then I'm looking for a shortest path from a point in copy 0, 0 to the corresponding point in copy H. Okay. So, uh, what do I do? Um, I say, well, I, I basically, I want to find the shortest cycle in every homology class. So if I guess a vertex that, that, that the cycle goes through, I can look at copy 0, 0, build the shortest path tree from v comma 0, and look at the shortest path to v comma 1, 0, v comma 1, 1, v comma 0, 1. And, and those are candidates for the shortest homologous cycle in each of those, in, in each of those classes. Um, in fact, using the same multiple short shortest path trick that we used, uh, we talked about last time, we can reduce, instead of needing to look at all n vertices, you can reduce to effectively uh, looking at, at some function of g vertices. Uh, and so you end up with a running time that depends exponentially on the genus, but for any fixed genus is just as fast as uh, doing things in the plane. So for, um, it's exponential in the genus, but in terms of the complexity of the surface, it's just n log n. Now, and then there's some post-processing. In fact, the post-processing, the complexity doesn't even depend on n that I use to sew the, the, the various component cycles together into the minimum cut. Uh, I'm not, not going to go into the details of that. Um, but the punchline is that I can compute minimum cuts in undirected surface graphs in exponential in genus times n log n time. Yes? If G is part of the input, um, yes, I can compute minimum cuts in any graph in quadratic time. Okay? So if I just ignore the topology completely, I get something that looks like n squared. So this is only better if the genus is less than, than log n. Okay? If the genus is 5, this is, this is better. Except if the genus is 5, this is only better uh, because that, that 2 to the order g is like 2 to the 10 or 2 to the 20, so n has to be pretty big before the, the thing takes over. So this is not necessarily the most practical result, but at least it's a, it's a proof that, in principle, cuts are easier to compute in surfaces of small genus. Now, one of the things that's a little bit frustrating about this result is we took a problem that can be solved in quadratic time by just ignoring the topology and just thinking of them as graphs, and we reduce it to an exponential number of instances of an NP-hard problem. Right, because we have an exponential number of homology classes, and for each one, we need to find the shortest cycle in that homology class. And we did that by blowing up to this exponentially larger graph. It turns out that that exponential explosion is necessary. Finding the shortest cycle in an arbitrary homology class that I just give you the vector and say, go, find me the best cycle, or the shortest subgraph, or you know, there's a bunch of different versions of this problem. Any version you can think of is NP-hard. In fact, there are recent results that, that, that show, um, at least if you work over uh, uh, not Z2, but a larger finite field, uh, that it's, it's hard to even approximate the, the, the shortest cycle um, uh, to within what, you know, small constant. Um, but every time I say exponential, I mean exponential in the genus. Um, and so when the genus is constant, it's exponential in a constant, so, uh, you know, we can pretend that that doesn't matter. That's correct. I don't know which homology classes 
um, make up the individual components of that multiple set of cycles. So if I told you, then you would be if, I told, if you told me, then I'd get rid of one layer of exponential. But still, finding the shortest cycle in your favorite homology class is an NP-hard problem. But if I can factor it out into dependence on genus and dependent on n, it's an exponential dependence on the genus and linear dependence on n. So this is an example, um, Ben talked about this earlier, of a fixed parameter tractable algorithm. Um, in Ben's case, he was interested in the parameter in question was the tree width of the dual graph of some triangulation of a three manifold. In this case, the parameter is the genus of the underlying surface. I'm sorry? You use the fact that you knew you could get a, a base point? Um, do, the question is, do I use the fact that I can guess a base point? So this is how we apply the multiple short shortest path algorithm. We know that any interesting cycle is going to cross one of these, these generating paths. So we cut along the generating paths and run multiple short shortest paths <coughs> along that path. OK. So, this is what I want to say about minimum cuts. Uh, the next few talks, the next few slides are about maximum flows. Now is a reasonable time for me to pause, ask if there are any more questions about minimum cuts. Yes? So in fact, um, so the question is, does it help if we have multiple shortest paths? In fact, as a technical condition, the algorithms actually need to assume that shortest paths are unique. Okay. And so I, this is one of the slides that I skipped over yesterday. I went, rah, 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 technical details. The technical details are in order to time the pivoting of the edges as they come in and out for multiple short shortest paths, we need to know that there's only one pivot at a time. We need to know that there is a V shortest path tree. If there's ambiguity, it's, there are way, consistent ways of breaking ties, but in order to make the algorithm work, we actually have to break those ties. Okay, so having ties actually kind of gets in the way of making our algorithms work. So, um, so I want to find the minimum cut between S and T, right? So by duality, I want to find a, a minimum subgraph in uh, some homology class. And by another reduction, I want to find the minimum cycle in some homology class. I, I, subgraphs are made of cycles, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I find the individual cycles and sew them up. You don't actually know which cycle, but suppose I told you which cycle. What do you mean, tell me the cycle? Well, you tell you the homology class. So this is literally a for all homology classes do the following thing. Right. So if you tell me the homology class, then I don't need that for loop. Right, but I still am going to have an exponential dependence because I need to lift to this covering space. Okay, uh, and this becomes basically uh, uh, a shortest path problem in the homology cover covering space. That's right. Right. So there's there's two exponential blowups. One where I go from subgraphs to I don't know which homology classes of cycles to check, so try them all. And another, because to find the shortest cycle within a single homology class, I have to go to this exponentially larger cover space. But you know, if the genus is three, then this is two multiples of eight, or you know. If we're doing the real problem, instead of the Z mod 2 Z problem, yeah. we're here. OK? Good. Uh, what goes wrong in the directed case? Uh, 
Um, part of what goes wrong is uh, Z2 is fundamentally undirected. There's no difference between going forward along an edge and going back. You either include the edge or you don't. Right, so um, we just were never able to get these two things to, to talk to each other. That somehow, um, in, in the undirected case, Z2 homology just fell out. Um, in the directed case, even in the planar setting, in the directed case, that reduction I showed you doesn't work. Right? The, the directed minimum cut problem, effectively the only algorithm we know is first compute a maximum flow and then the minimum cut falls out. In the maximum flow, it'll turn out we'll end up using real homology. Um, and that's the right thing to do when you have a direction. Right? I'm being, it's a little hard to explain why things don't work. I mean, the short answer is we, we were never able to figure out how to make it work. But I think the intuition is Z2 doesn't have a sense of direction. So if you, ha if you need a sense of direction, you can't use Z2. So um, this boils down to a question of definitions. So um, typically in a directed graph, when you talk about a cut, what you want is a collection of edges that's, that split every directed path from S to T. And so all the edges actually have to be oriented the same direction. Any other questions? Okay, so um, maximum flows. So um, in the case of cuts in planar graphs, we observe this kind of duality. We, we move to the dual graph and we reduce to a shortest path problem. Okay, so there's this duality between short, cheap cuts and shortest paths. Now, flows are uh, kind of a much more continuous smelling thing. It's not just these three edges, but rather send, send some flow here and it splits and it merges and it goes back together and, and it, it sort of moves through the system, but it moves through the system everywhere. It's distributed. Nevertheless, there is a duality between maximum flows and shortest paths, um, which is captured by uh, this lemma, which first appeared in um, a 1983 PhD thesis by Venkatesan, although some special cases appeared earlier. Um, now, remember that a flow is an assignment of values to the edges so that no edge gets more flow than its capacity, than, than, than its maximum allowable flow. There's conservation at the vertices. That's what the word feasible means that anything that flows in must also flow out. Um, and, I, and I'm ultimately trying to find the maximum value flow that I can. But let's for the moment just say, can I find a flow that sends 17 units of vodka from Moscow to Berlin? Okay. Um, then the theorem says that there is a feasible flow with that value if and only if a certain kind of dual graph has no cycles with negative total weight. Now, people who are used to thinking about shortest paths, people who are used to taking algorithms, um, uh, are, are maybe used to thinking about what it means to take a shortest path when you have edges with negative weights. You should think of it more like a tax or a refund instead of a length. You want to find the cheapest path that goes somewhere else. Negative cycles, people learn to fear because if there is a negative cycle where, okay, if I go from here to Hungary and I exchange my currency, I'll get this. And if I go from Hungary to the UK and change it into pounds, I'll get this. And if I go from the UK to the US and get dollars, I'll get this. And if I fly back to Paris, I convert back to euros. And if it's possible to end up with more money, then there is no cheapest way to fly home because I can just go around in this circle and as much as I want forever and ever and keep making more money. Same thing happens with negative cycles. If there's a cycle that you can go around that has negative total length, 
shortest paths don't really exist. Because there's always a shorter, lower cost way by just going around the loop one more time. Um, so negative cycles is already a thing that people used to playing with shortest paths know to watch out for. Um, what's this dual residual network that I'm talking about? Well, the way that we normally like to think about maximum flows um, is, is, bears some resemblance to the way we normally like to think about shortest paths. We make a guess of what the current flow is. We pick some feasible flow, initially all zeros, and then we see if it's possible to improve it. And the way we decide whether it's possible to improve it is we build this thing called the residual network. So what the residual network encodes is for each edge, how much more flow can we push forward along that edge? And then we encode using a reversed edge, how much less flow can I push before I get back down to zero? All right. So pushing two units of flow forward is the same as pushing negative two units of flow backwards. So here, if, for example, if you look at this edge going down from the left to, that says five units of flow and an edge of, of capacity seven, um, remember that's an undirected edge with capacity seven, then I can send two more units of flow down that edge until it's full. Or I can send 12 more units backwards along that edge until it's full in the other direction. Does that make sense? Right, so it's five forward minus 12 would be negative seven. That's the same as seven going backwards. Um, this bottom edge is oversaturated. This is not feasible, but we can think about the mathematical abstraction anyway. If I'm sending four units, if I'm trying to send four units of flow down an edge with capacity two, then in the forward direction, I'm already oversaturated. I need to send two less units of flow in the forward direction in order to become feasible. Uh, but if I want to push flow backwards, I could push, push it up to six units of flow going backwards before um, the edge becomes full in the backwards direction. Um, and so given a example flow in my network, I can construct this residual network. And basically, you look for new paths that can carry flow in the residual network. And you can add the flows together like vectors. Not like vectors. They, are vectors, okay? So um, this is a standard algorithmic tool that, that, that algorithm people like. Um, this shows up in Ford and Fulkerson's augmenting path algorithm for constructing these things. Um, but I, I need to put this picture up and kind of let it sink in for a little bit because I don't think most of you have seen it before, okay? Now, if I take the residual network and I dualize it, I get the dual residual network. Now remember the dual of a planar graph that's directed. I take each of those directed edges and I rotate it 90 degrees to clockwise. So this edge going down and to the right that has weight two turns 90 degrees clockwise to an edge that goes down and to the left with weight two. Um, and so what I, what I don't want to find is a negative cycle in this graph over here. Um, I'm going to show you a sketch of the proof. It's going to wash over you. You can look at the slides later. Don't worry if it doesn't go in. If there are no negative cycles, then in fact, shortest path distances are well defined. And you can use those shortest path distances to explicitly construct a feasible flow with the right value in the graph. Details, details, details. Uh, the other direction is the one that, that, that actually ha can draw a picture. If there's a negative cycle in the dual residual graph, what that corresponds to back in the primal graph is a co-cycle, otherwise known as a cut. This is a collection of directed edges that, that uh, so that every directed path from S to T contains at least one of those directed edges. And the total residual capacity along those edges is negative. I've tried to send a certain amount of flow from S to T, and then I look at what's left to be able to send from S to T, and there's this cut where the, total, the amount that I can send more is actually negative. 
I've already sent too much flow through this cut. And that means the value that I've, of, the, of the flow that I tried to send was too high. There is no feasible flow with that value. I need to bring my estimate down. Okay. Pause. Pause. Questions? Yes. Okay, so remember, the residual graph depends on the original capacities and on some flow that I subtract from those capacities. On the entire graph. On the entire graph. So the idea is I take my original capacities, I try to send 17 units of flow through the graph any way I can. One path with 17 units, three paths with 10, 10, and negative three units, doesn't matter. Um, that gives me a, a flow that I, I'm, I'm hoping that there's something feasible that looks like this. So then I build the residual graph and I look for negative cycles in its dual. And if I find one, that means there's no way to move the flow around to make it feasible. Because I'm always going to be sending more flow through this cut than there is capacity in this cut. Okay. okay. So Venkatasan's lemma gives us a way of testing if I guess a flow value, whether that guess is too high or too low. And so in principle, I could just do a binary search at this point. But um, uh, I'm going to do something slightly different because it, 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 it works and it's efficient. Um, I'm not going to do a binary search over the possible parameters. I'm literally going to set the parameter to zero and continuously increase it until something breaks. Okay, I'm going to do what's called a parametric shortest path problem. So I'm, I'm in terms of the flow, I'm going to say, let's start by guessing the flow value zero. Does that work? Well, sure. I can send no flow through any graph. And then I say, well, let's try epsilon, two epsilon, three epsilon, but you actually do it continuously. And at some point, at some critical value, a negative cycle will show up in the dual residual graph. Okay. Um, in terms of the dual shortest path problem, what this means is the, the lengths of the edges that I'm using to define shortest paths are no longer constants. They're now linear functions of this parameter that I'm changing. And uh, Karp and Orlin in the 1980s define this problem that I, I have gra graph with linearly changing edges uh, find the range of values for that parameter that where shortest paths are well defined. Right, I mean, that's the, that's the problem, right? I, I can't actually really algorithmically do things continuously. Okay. But I'm going to end up doing something very much like what I did yesterday, which is I'm actually just going to look for critical values where some structure changes. And the, what that structure is, is a shortest path tree. So as long as there are no negative cycles, shortest paths are well defined. So I'm going to use the fact that shortest paths are well defined. I'm going to certify that shortest paths are well defined by computing them. So I compute a shortest path tree in the original residual graph where the parameter value is zero. I'm going to slowly change the value of that parameter up and up and up and up. And as I do that, the lengths of these edges will change in a particular way. And at certain critical values of the parameter, the shortest path tree will change by a pivot. Some edge will become tense, and I need to pivot it into the tree, exactly like we did last time. And so I get this sequence of pivots. And eventually, the edge that becomes tense when I pivot it in breaks the tree. You'll notice what happened. This thing that I have here, this structure is no longer a tree. It, the, that light blue edge isn't really there. I just pivoted it out. It's disconnected, and it has a cycle. And these are two things that trees never have. And that cycle is the, negative, the first time a negative cycle will appear um, in the residual graph.
So the moment that cycle appears, I'm right at the critical value where a negative cycle appears. That means I'm right at the maximum possible value that I can, where I can have a maximum flow. So um, what do I do? I do exactly the same data structure stuff that I did last time uh, to, so that I can locate pivots quickly and, and execute them quickly. Uh, there are a linear number of pivots just like last time, um, so the overall running time of the algorithm is n log n. I'm playing again with trees and co-trees, and uh, again, I have this path uh, in the dual spanning tree where the, ed the next edge that's going to pivot in actually lives. And so when I pivot, uh, I'm looking for things along this path, and I, and I update both the original shortest path three and its dual. And eventually, uh, I find a cycle in the primal, and that de disconnects the dual. Um, but now I need to analyze this, okay? Um, so bef previously I had a disk and I was moving the source around the disk and there was a sort of, I could analyze how many times a single edge pivots in by considering a single shortest path tree in that disk. Here I can't do that because the short, I don't have a single set of distances anymore. I have a continuously varying set of distances. Um, so things are a little bit more um, interesting. Uh, it turns out that the right way to think about this is to remember that the dual of a graph that has two special vertices, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing that I did for cuts. Uh, in the dual graph, I've got these two special faces, S and T. I'm going to remove them. The, the shortest path trees that I'm maintaining actually live on this annulus, not just in a planar graph, but really in an annulus. Um, and uh, in order to think about what happens on the annulus, I'm going to think about what happens in the universal cover of that annulus, which is just an infinite strip. Of course, this infinite strip is made up of copies of the annulus that I get by cutting along the, uh, some path between the two boundaries. And it turns out what happens is uh, you can think of the shortest path tree, you can lift that up to the, the universal cover, and it's going to be part of the infinite tree of shortest paths in this infinite strip. And when I'm doing pivots, I'm basically sort of sliding a window from left to right up to the first point where the shortest path tree contains a path from some lift of a vertex to the next lift of the same vertex. I'm going from one lift to the next that corresponds to a cycle that goes around the annulus once. Um, at this point, I'm just trying to show you the pictures because I think the technical details are starting to get a bit overwhelming. So bask in the pictures again. If it doesn't go in, if the only thing that you remember is flows look like shortest paths, look like homology. Did you say that one. I don't compute an infinite shortest path tree. All the computation happens in the annulus. I'm looking at what happens in the, in the universal cover only for purposes of analysis. Okay, so the, the way that you analyze what goes on is you say, um, okay, uh, look at a particular edge in my annular graph, and when does that, how often does that edge pivot into the shortest path tree? Um, that turns out to be modeled by looking at a particular lift of, uh, of that edge in the universal cover and asking um, when do I, you know, which lifts of the origin, the source of the, um, of, of the shortest path tree, contain that edge um, in their shortest path trees. So I reverse the shortest path tree, I look at all the shortest paths going to Q0, um, and I, again, I get this infinite tree, but it's still the case by the Jordan curve theorem that there's going to be a, continuo a contiguous interval of lifts of the origin that will connect to Q through P, right? So 
It's exactly the same Jordan curve theorem argument that I gave for multiple shortest paths actually implies, again, in this case, even though the graph is infinite, that um, I'm only going to pivot in once and pivot out once for each edge. So again, this is the disk tree lemma. So um, the punchline is that if you're doing shortest path, if you're doing maximum flows in planar graphs, ultimately this is about maintaining some kind of shortest path structure as it evolves. And the right way to think about the evolution of that shortest path tree is by lifting up to the, um, to the universal cover of the dual annulus and reasoning about how shortest paths change, change upstairs even though the algorithm doesn't actually compute that higher, uh, that, that infinite, infinite, infinite covering space. Okay. Um, we've got, let's say in the five more minutes left, I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures about how flows work in higher genus surfaces. Um, again, it's homology. And um, uh, the, what happens in planar graphs is essentially we, we're guessing the value of the flow. We start at zero and we increase it until something breaks. There's a one parameter family of flows that we need to investigate. When we go to higher genus surfaces, there is no longer a one dimensional version of flow that we need to contemplate. Um, because there's, in fact, an entire homology space of flows that we need to contemplate, a 2G plus one dimensional thing. Um, so uh, instead of thinking about homology in Z, Z, Z2 coefficients, we think about homology in real coefficients. And what homology in real coefficients means is uh, a boundary circulation is something that you get by taking the boundary of a function from the faces to the reals. If I assign a face, a real number to every face, then the value that I attach in the boundary circulation to an edge is the value to my right minus my, the value to my left. If you think of the, the face numbers as an Alexander numbering, um, you can think of the circulation as the curve that that Alexander numbering is defined for except now they're real numbers instead of just integers, and they can differ by more than one. Okay. And then two flows are homologous if their difference is a homology, is a, is a boundary circulation. This is the real analog of two subgraphs are homologous if their symmetric difference is a boundary subgraph. Okay. And so I get a real vector space. It has 2G plus 1 dimensions, again, by the same parameter counting. In this case, I have to switch which, one, which time I'm subtracting one, which time I'm, I'm, I'm adding two, but uh, it's, it's basically the same calculation as before. Um, and now, instead of saying that, a, that I have a flow with a particular value uh, that's feasible, if and only if some graph has no negative cycles, it's if I have a flow with a particular homology class that's feasible, if and only if some, some related dual graph has no negative cycles. Finding negative cycles in a higher genus graphs eh, it takes a little bit of work. It's a divide and conquer -y thing involving separators. Uh, you don't care about the details. Um, but it can be done in near linear time for any fixed genus and polynomial time overall. Um, which means that if I guess a homology class for my target flow, then um, I can test whether there's a feasible flow in that class reasonably quickly. Um, I need a way of testing what the val the what is, sorry, I need a way of coming up with an example flow in any given homology class. So again, I construct this set of directed paths from S to T, whose complement is a disk. There's exactly 2G plus one of them. And I use this as the basis for my flow homology space. So this allows me to guess a flow with a particular homology class, just load up these paths with the right values, and then check the shortest path thing. Now, unfortunately, I can't continuously optimize over 2G plus one dimensions. 
It just, you, there isn't like a path to follow. It's much more complicated. And that's because the set of feasible values is no longer just an interval. It turns out to be a convex polytope. I have linear inequalities that determine whether uh, a given homology class is or is not feasible. In particular, basically I have cuts which have their own cohomology classes and the flow has to push less through those cuts than their total capacity. And so I get this weird convex polytope in 2G plus one dimensions. If you've seen maximum flows in linear programming before, maximum flows is, is naturally an order n dimensional linear programming problem. So I take the n dimensional convex polytope and just project it down into this homology subspace and that's the polytope that I get. That's not the polytope I get, that's just a polytope I pulled off Wikipedia. But it's a polytope. Okay. Um, and so in principle I have a linear program with only order G variables. Unfortunately, the number of constraints, the best upper bound I can prove is about n to the order G constraints. This is way too big to actually solve explicitly. And so now I go down, to, down the street to my friends in industrial engineering and I say, I've got this linear program. Um, I can tell you whether a, whether a point is feasible. And if a point isn't feasible, I can find a negative cycle. I can find some constraint that's being violated. And they say, yeah, you're done. So um, I, at this point, I pull out the, the, the atomic sledgehammers and say, oh, you have something that we like to call a membership oracle. Given a point in this space, I can tell you whether it's inside the polytope or not. You also have something called a separation oracle. Given a, given a point that's outside the polytope, I can find a hyperplane that separates the point from the polytope. And if you have these two things, there are standard methods that go back to the 1970s, uh, but were really developed in the, in, in the 80s, that called, there's a, one of the, the ways of formulating the first polynomial time algorithm for linear programming was the ellipsoid method. And all you need to make the ellipsoid method work in polynomial time is a polynomial time membership oracle. And if you have a separation oracle, it's even better. And so if we pour the, the ingredients we have into the uh, ellipsoid method, we get this horrible running time. It's not as horrible as other running times that we've already seen. The digits, the, the exponents only have one digit, but it's an ugly digit. Um, and then more recent work involving random walks and polytopes actually allows you to bring this complexity down. Now, from a practical standpoint, you want to avoid this algorithm like the plague because anything that involves running the ellipsoid method is going to be terribly, horribly, incredibly, very bad, no good day. I mean, you're just not gonna have a good time with this. One of the reasons why this is as slow as it is is every iteration of the algorithm, you need one more bit of precision in your arithmetic. So you, you, you can't get away without with, with this without doing high precision um, exact real arithmetic. Uh, it's, it's really horrible. Um, one of the other things about both of these problems is uh, one feature of nice algorithms is you do the analysis, but in practice, things work better than the analysis predicts. Binary search is not one of those algorithms. And ultimately, you can think of this as a really horrible high dimensional version of binary search. The binary search algorithm is gonna take however many iterations it takes. Standard algorithms for flow look for ways of updating the flow and occasionally, and in fact, often in practice get lucky and finish in fewer iterations than you would expect. This is not one of those cases. The planar algorithm turns out in practice is significantly faster than the n log n time that the, that the analysis predicts. Binary search takes log n iterations, period. There's no way to speed it up. Well, in, in, for example, uh, in flow algorithms, the way that the textbook method for finding flow algorithms is try to find a path that you can push more flow along. Try to find another path that you can push more flow along. And there are really conservative ways of estimating how many times you need to push flow, but in practice, the number of times you need to push is very small. So in practice, you don't want to run this algorithm. This is a proof of concept that for small genus surfaces, 
you can profitably use topology to speed up the algorithm in principle. Um, what we would like is a simpler combinatorial algorithm that maybe a human being could implement in a finite amount of time that compute, that's as simple as the, as the parametric search algorithm uh, for, for planar flows that actually works and it provably works quickly. And we don't know how to do this even for graphs on the torus where every edge has unit weight and the graphs are undirected. It would be nice uh, if uh, we could actually do this. Wait. Well, okay, this is the same problem. I don't know why it's on there twice. Um, even if we have like polynomial dependence. Oh, right, n log n time when the, when the genus is a fixed constant. Even better, we'd like the, the dependence on the genus to be polynomial. Um, there's a, another problem called minimum cost flows where you don't just want to find a flow with a particular value, but you've got costs on the edges and you want to minimize that as well. Um, it's a very natural problem, and in this case, we don't know how to do anything even when the graphs are planar. So this is a case that I use to scare the computer scientists, say, no, 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 not everything about planar graphs is known. Um, and the reason why this is interesting is we started playing with this in higher genus graphs and we realized actually the problem isn't in the topology. The problem is actually in the graph stuff. Um, and with that, I, I think I will uh, turn off the fire hose and uh, take any final questions. You mean um, for for this? Yeah. Like, is it at least linearity or? Um, well, you need to read in the graph. So that's a linear lower bound. No, but for the genus. Oh, lower bounds as a function of the genus? Yeah. No, as it's it's entirely plausible. Well, okay, there has to be some dependence on the genus because uh, for similar reasons that um, we can't even find like minimum non-trivial cycles in subquadratic time. So there's, there's evidence that suggests that in general graphs, quadratic is a natural barrier, right? We do know of very slightly subquadratic algorithms for, for flows in sparse graphs, but it's like n squared over log something, right? Uh, getting a truly subquadratic algorithm in general sparse graphs would be a, would be a significant breakthrough. So getting something that has no dependence on the genus and linear time would that would be a, you know that would be a Turing award. Um, uh, so there's going to be some dependence on the genus to interpolate between n log n in the plane and n squared in general, but maybe it's only one g. But nobody knows how to prove lower bounds, so we're, you know, we're completely at sea here. Right. Similar with the, the, the minimum cut. So one possibility is we know that we can reduce the dependence on n from quadratic to linear by introducing an exponential dependence on the genus. We have no reason to, we, we don't know whether that exponential dependence on the genus is really necessary if we insist on a linear dependence on, on n. There, as far as I know, no one has ever considered like which problems are not fixed parameter linear, right? There's fixed parameter tractable where it's, exp it's NP hard in general, but it becomes polynomial if you can fix a parameter. This is like a fine grain version of that. It's quadratic in general, but it goes to linear if you can fix some parameter. That's an area of algorithm design that there are no results. So this might be a natural problem to study if you're interested in that sort of thing. But in particular, not only are there no positive results, there are no negative results uh, where we know certain problems that are NP hard don't have fixed parameter tractable algorithms. Maybe this is a problem where we don't have fixed parameter linear algorithms. Don't know.
n log n. So you end up with a linear number of pivots, just like MSSP, and each pivot takes log n time, just like MSSP. OK, so um, the constraints turn out to correspond to cycles in the dual graph. And what you need to uh, enforce is that the total amount of flow sent through that dual cycle is less than the capacity of that dual cycle. Um, it, within every cohomology class, they're, they're equivalent, they're, they're parallel, but the different, different homology classes are different and there's an infinite number of homology classes because we're working over the reals. Right, so with a little bit more work, you can bring it down to finite, right? <laughs> but that, the, the best upper bound that I've been able to come up with is like end of the order G. In, in principle, if you could show somehow that there are only n log n constraints that matter, then you just build the linear program with that many constraints and you solve it and you're, you're more or less done. But uh, I, I don't actually think this is likely. I think the, the, this flow homology to polytope actually is complicated. Unfortunately. Those are the best. Ultimately, we're really doing computation over the rationals anyway, so I could have just replaced real with rational all the way through. But um, uh, in, I mean, in particular, uh, if you have, if you start with integer constraints, the, your your answer, the maximum flow, is going to be an integer maximum flow. Every vertex of this polytope will have integer coefficients. But nevertheless, because I'm thinking about it as a continuous optimization problem, it's really best formulated as, well, I'm optimizing over the reals. And um, you know, the computation, yeah, I'm really doing it over the rationals, but it's more natural to think about things happening continuously and being defined continuously. It's largely a matter of religion, but I was raised as a computational geometer. Real numbers are atomic objects that we can play with. Okay, there are no other questions. I promise tomorrow, no data structures, no, no algorithms. They'll be just, just pictures. So thank you again. <laughs>